<clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Black. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here at First African Baptist in Savannah, Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Dr. Rationese Candy Tate, and I'm with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, okay. the Atlanta Organizing Branch, and here to talk about your veterans' history okay. today, June 28, 2015. Okay. All right. So, uh, when and where were you born? I was born here in Savannah, Georgia on uh, January 6, 1943. And who were your parents and what were their occupations? My parents were uh, Lucille and Abraham Black, uh, and they were domestic workers. And do you have any siblings? I have, uh, well, I have three sisters, one that is deceased and one brother deceased. Okay. And, um, their names and were any of them in the military? My brother was, uh, his name was John, he was in the Navy. Uh, my three sisters were not in the service. Okay, okay. They, uh, Gloria, Kathy, and Ruth. And then where did you fall in the birth, was, birth order? I was the, the baby boy uh, of the third, third child. Third child. Yeah, baby boy. So two brothers born? One brother. Three girls, three sisters. Oh, one brother, sister, okay. One sister, a baby and sister. I was in between those. Yeah. I got it now. <laughs> um, and what were you doing before you entered the service? I was working as a uh, waiter at a restaurant in, in Washington, D.C., uh, a place by the name of uh, McDonald's, not McDonald's, O'Donnell's, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> O'Donnell's. Yeah, so, restaurant. gotcha. So, how did you get from Savannah to working at a restaurant in D.C. before you Well, I went to school here in Savannah, graduated in Savannah. I left here shortly after uh, I graduated. Now, that was high school, college? High school. Okay. High school. Mm -hmm. Where'd you go? Where did you attend high school? Savannah, uh, Beach High School. Okay. Uh, married my childhood sweetheart and we moved to uh, D.C. Okay. And her name is? Julian Black. Okay. Uh, and uh, I left, really kind of, when I left here to go to D.C., I changed my draft board from Savannah to D.C. Actually, I was drafted out of D.C. Okay. Yeah. And what year was that? It was 1967. Okay. 67. Okay, so tell me a little bit, bit about the early days of service. What branch of the military did you serve in? Well, I was uh, drafted into the Army. I took my basic training at uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, very new experience to me. <laughs> uh, you know, being drafted, didn't want to go in the first place. And being drafted, and but, but it turned out to be a pretty good experience because it got me a chance to meet different people and make them do a little good travel. Okay. It wasn't that bad. I mean, after being in there, it wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to back up a little bit because I'm you moved to D.C., but I didn't get the why. For a better opportunity. Okay. So that's where jobs were, that's where the money was. Okay. And it says, you know, did you specific, so the Army drafted you, so you didn't get to select one over the other? No, okay. I, I really didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons was because of what was going on in uh, Vietnam, mm -hmm. during the Vietnam crisis, I didn't want to go. Okay. And I saw a lot of uh, people that I knew, and actually, well, not really knew, but actually family members. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I was guy actually got killed, with it, and I really didn't want to go. Okay. So what did, what, what did you hear about? The, um, so you've heard family members were being killed, but what was the well, kind of the know. sentiment here in the States? Well, you know, that frightened me, because <laughs> I'm, I'm the never violent person. And, and and for the time they were over there, actually in the military, and the time they got killed, you know, it couldn't possibly have been an experience. Though. So, you know, <laughs> that, that, that within itself was kind of frightening to me. And tell us a little bit about training camp. Training camp, there was eight weeks of training camp. Like I stated earlier, uh, did in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, pardon my French, but it was hell. <laughs> <laughs> How so? Um, you know, it was a different experience to me. Uh, being told what I had to do, uh, getting up early, uh, just the routine type things. You know, I mean, not getting used to it. I wasn't used to it. And, um, 
being, I guess I get away to the service now as, like, as an old guy, so to speak, because I was actually like 25 when I went to the military. Okay. Um, and uh, the guys I was with, you know, they were younger, mm -hmm. you know, 18, 19, 20. So that was a brand new experience to me, getting used to, you know, the, I guess the routine stuff, exercise and that type of stuff. It took me a while to get used to, but I did. Okay. And then how was it, um, was everyone, were they from the South, the North, from no, everywhere? No, they were a mixture of people, and it's funny because there were, there were four guys in the same barracks and we had the same name. Charles A. Black. And I was the only one that was Charles A. Black that was black. <laughs> okay. And uh, I don't know what you're familiar with, but as far as signing you up for, for PT, everyone had to pull their turn PT in the kitchen. So when they wake up early in the morning, the guy would come in the, the, the barracks to wake up the Charles A. Black. He didn't know which one it was. Mm -hmm. So he woke all of us up. You know, that was, you know, that wasn't going to go too well because so guys being woke up, why are you waking me up? I thought it was him. You know, so that was kind of funny in a sense. <laughs> uh, any, uh, how did you build teamwork, camaraderie, race relations between? Well, uh, being in the military, you know, you don't really know anyone. Yeah, I guess you have to warm up to people. Mm -hmm. you know, people that you, you know, you start a conversation off show low and then you see the person, the person feel comfortable talking to you. That's how the conversation gets started. Okay. And then it's moved on. If you, if you talk to me or this guy where you don't know, talk to a friend of mine, it's, you know, it's thought straight in mm -hmm. That's how it works. But you went in, as you said, knowing folks that had been Well, and being afraid to be actually scared to death. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, got married. I was married when I went in. That's another thing. Um, it, was, it was a different life for me. Mm -hmm. Totally different. i never been away from home. I mean, I've been away from home, but a place I've never been before was seeing brand new people, experiencing things I've never seen before. And it was very uncomfortable for me. Right. Right. Uh, do you remember any special in, instructor or incident in the training? It's been a long You've time. Been? Uh, not really. I can't think of names. I remember faces, but not names. Okay. Any incident, or Basic particular training. Mm -hmm, in, during training? Yeah, uh, it's funny. This, this guy, uh, this is a white guy. Uh, wrote a letter to his parents and say that he was not getting enough to eat. Okay. And his parents went to her, her congressman and complained to him. And just kind of filtered down. Mm -hmm. But long story short, was uh, the uh, platoon sergeant told everyone in the barracks about he writing home to his mother saying he wouldn't get enough to eat. So what he did was he had the whole barracks, the whole platoon, that when they went to whatever, whatever meal they went to, whatever food they had left, make sure they gave it to him. So he had enough to eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, you couldn't imagine how that went. This guy had food, you know, I mean, egg, he had eggs running off his plate and he used to eat off the big trays. Right. He had eggs and bacon and toast and sausage and stuff on his plate. And the platoon sergeant went to him and said, you have to eat it all. So we don't want you writing mama telling her you're not getting enough to eat. Oh my. Well, that didn't last very long. He sat there and, you know, he, and after, you, after we ate, we had to go out and do PT. So you can't run around on a full stomach. After sitting there, you know, and I mean, we weren't talking about the best of food either. You know, that stuff was, you can learn to like it. It wasn't that great. Right. But you, you know, you ate that stuff too. You had to survive. So he wrote his mom back and told her, you know, don't do that ever again. Don't you ever complain about it. Like that. Well, she said, hey, you know, her only son, and he was telling her he was hungry. She wouldn't let her congressman know. She wouldn't get enough to eat. It's a valuable <laughs> lesson learned there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. It really was funny. Did you receive any specialized training? Specialized training? Not really, no. It was just... I went to, well, specialized training as far as what I went to. I went to the uh, Signal Coast School after I got a basic training. I wanted to be an air traffic controller. That's so really what I wanted to be. <laughs> but um, that didn't work out too well because that's when I found out I was colorblind. I was supposed to be on a 22 weeks course. I could take all the written exams, ace them. Well, I actually went into the, to the uh, shop to actually do it, the flexible wiring thing. I couldn't do it because 
I mean, the code, yeah. and then, you know, everything's based on code as far as being air traffic control. You have to know the color code you have to do. Because a lot of people may not realize this because you have to know the color code in order to wire things and make things work. But what I was, I was calling uh, uh, brown, green, green, brown, and red, orange. And, uh, you know, there's really no cue for that. <laughs> so I ended up getting transferred out of, out of the single core and went to mechanic school, which is my second love. And what did you do there? I was a mechanic. I was a truck mechanic. Okay, for trucks. Okay. Yeah. And you knew some of that training already? Or well, I before I left here, I was flew around with cars. In fact, I still do that today. Okay. And I came back to Savannah and actually organized a car club. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like old cars. I like taking old cars. And that's what I love to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talked about the foods, uh, life in the barracks. Say it was hard life having. in the barracks were. You know, I guess it was like a Boy Scout camp. Mm -hmm. Got all these guys in there, and you know, we got uh, everybody's got different personalities. You know, we were integrated at the time. Uh, you had to really meet with people to sort of like, I guess it was like prison expense to say you belong with somebody. You had buddies to hang out with. You really didn't know them, and the more you stayed with them, you got to learn. And that, that worked out. Because uh, we still had a racial problem back then, mm -hmm. you, know, you know. I mean, this, this was we were we were I guess together, but we were separate but equal, if you want to call it that. But uh, there was you know there was a race problem there, definitely was. So even separate but equal. I mean, I was we're not there. So someone looking, kind of tell us what what was happening. What was we going were on. we were U.S. soldiers, mm -hmm. but we were black and we were white. So you had different standards for different, you know, the blacks hung together and the whites hung together. Mm -hmm. But we were U.S. soldiers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we get a little, when I went to Vietnam, I'll tell you exactly what I mean by I mean, what I said by that. Okay. But then socially, so socially you hung out separately. Black guys. Yeah. Black guy hung with the black guys and white guys hung with the white guys. There were a few whites that, you know, that I guess hardcore whites that hang out with the blacks, but, you know, they kind of took with them. White stuff with the whites and the black stuff with the blacks. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the kind of the physical regiment of kind of give me a up at morning to, to night, what would what would that be like? In basic training, you you you, you, you know, you didn't really want to stay up too late because you never had to deal with the next day. And you needed all the rest you could get. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact I lost weight in the military. When I first went in the military, I lost weight. Which was a good thing. I was smoking during the time I stopped smoking too. Couldn't smoke and, and put up what I was doing too. Something had to go. Uh, but it was, a, it was a good experience because it got me, it gave me the chance to meet new different people, black and white. Mm -hmm. And I ended up, uh, you know, talking to a couple of black guys, a couple of white guys that we kind of hit it off of. We weren't buddy buddies, but we used to have carry on a conversation. Right, right. So where did you serve? I left for. Uh, I was drafted out of, out of uh, Washington, D.C. I was told we were going to stop in Washington when we were going to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, but that was a lie. <laughs> we stopped, but we only stopped, but you know, I told them, I called my wife and told them to meet me at the train station because I was actually inducted into the Army. And uh, the time that they told us that we were supposed to be in D.C., that didn't happen, we ended up taking a bus trip. <laughs> um, we left D.C. and the first stop was in Richmond, Virginia. Couldn't use the telephone or anything, you know. Couldn't call nobody because they're, they're at the train station looking for me. We didn't use the train, we went on the bus. And I didn't get the chance to communicate with her until two weeks after I was in North Carolina. But, you know, she called and contacted me when it happened and told me I was okay. It's just that uh, they lied to us. So you thought you were going to be stopping They told us we were going to stop at the train station. Mm -hmm. So I, I sneaked off and got on the pay phone, called my wife and said, Look, I'm in the Army. This is the time we'd be at the train station. She said, so she can come down and meet me. Well, that didn't happen. We didn't go by train with our bus. <laughs> 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 we, didn't, we didn't stop in D.C. We stopped in Richmond. Yeah. So none of it was... You no know, way I could, you know, it wasn't no cell phone back during that time. So I knew where she was looking for me, and I wasn't there. Right. So, I mean, we, um, how was that at that point for your marriage? Well, by me going to the military, and I, I was married, it wasn't a good thing, but... <laughs> You know, something I had to deal with. Okay. And so actually, get us to Vietnam. So how did... 
Uh, funny thing about that, uh, finished basic training. I, I told you I went to Singapore school, school in Fort Mall, New Jersey. <clears throat> then went back to uh, Fort Bragg to finish up my uh, what I'm order training. Uh, I got my orders to go to Vietnam. And the uh, funny thing about this was I was in Oakland, California, preparing to go to Vietnam. I went to Vietnam the same day that Martin Luther King was assassinated. Mm -hmm. and I didn't find that out until after I got to uh, Hawaii. The reason why I found that out was that, that during that same day, they blacked out everything on post. Okay. And no one was allowed to come on post or leave post because they didn't want us to know because had we known, I don't think I would have went. Mm -hmm. uh, when we stopped in <clears throat> Hawaii, I went into the airport to the bar and I saw the stuff on the TV monitor. I thought it was a movie. I'm looking at this thing like, I asked the guy, what's the name of this movie? He said, that's not a movie. You didn't know what happened? I said, what happened? He said, Dr. King was assassinated. I said, what? He said, yeah. I said, you kidding me? He said, no. I said, when did this happen? He said, it happened today. And they were showing pictures where they actually had fires going on in D.C. I'm like, oh my God. It was right then, then, then it dawned on me like, well, that's the reason why things were so hush hush at from camp that day because we were allowed to leave. Because that's exactly what happened. Yep. And so, did you get to you know, having family in D.C.? Did you get to finally communicate with them and hear? Well, you know, well, another thing I mentioned too. When I was in the military, I wrote letters every day. <laughs> I got a letter every day, and everybody, a lot of guys didn't get mail, but I got a letter every day because I wrote a letter every day. I wrote all my relatives, my mother-in-law, my sisters. Because that was the only thing to keep me going. Getting the letter every day reading it. Mm -hmm. Although the letter was like a week old, but the news to me, you know. It was you able to catch up and keep up right. with family. Mm -hmm. I wrote it every day. <laughs> so what were so we the day you left was the day that um, King Dr. Was King was assassinated. And then tell me about well, you went to uh, Hawaii right after right after uh, I got in the country. Right after the tent, you know, the tent. Tent. Mm -hmm. It's a celebration in Vietnam with the Vietnam people just go crazy. It's okay. like on uh, 4th of July. Type okay. Thing. And um, on my way to, to uh, Bay Noir, which was the installation center, uh, there were, I noticed all these dead people on the side of the road. So I've never seen that like this before. And um, looking at things, and the guy was telling us, he said, well, what happened was, Viet Cong were trying to overrun over, over, over the, the, the post where we're going. And this is where they killed them at. They, you know, they, they just came over and shot them all. And they were actually digging a hole, mm -hmm. like a ditch, and just pushing the bodies mm -hmm. um, in the hole, covering them up. It was, I mean, it was, I've never seen anything like that before. And then you start thinking, like, oh my God, what am I doing here? Right. <laughs> I saw it, and you know I had I had uh, had nightmares about it tonight that night. Mm -hmm. uh, never seen anything like that before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was tough, I'm sure. Um, so were you? Did you have to fight on the front lines, or what was your? My job. Like, I was job? assigned to a um, engineer company. What we did was we'd actually build roads and helicopters, for, heli pads for planes and chops could actually come and land in on um, um, base. And like support. We're actually combat engineers because a lot of times we're actually, I'm out there repairing vehicles. We got fired on. <laughs> so I had to put the wrench down and grab the gun. <laughs> <laughs> from mechanic to, yeah. well, <laughs> to I mean, soldier. The second thing there was, 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 was uh, infantry, infantry anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the second, that was the first one, the basic training. Okay. You know, you had two, actually two jobs. The second job was actually, you know, kind of scared out of fighting, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you share with us, you know, your feelings of seeing casualties and the destruction. Well, uh, while I was stationed, I went from Benoit to Coochie. That was my base place in Coochie. And uh, one of the things I was witnessed that kind of got to me too was this guy uh, <clears throat> in my platoon. I don't remember his name. 
white guy. Uh, he got this dear young lady from the States. And his fiance was told him that uh, she wasn't waiting no long. She got tired of waiting on him. So he took this fortified pistol, went back in the barracks, blew his brains out. I knew the guy. I don't mean that person, but I knew him. Sure. So, yeah. so tense being in the war zone was very tense and Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Just tough mentally. You know, a guy, he in the military, he's waiting about his to see his wife or girlfriend when he got back and he, she told him she wouldn't wait no more for him. He snapped. Take yourself out. Mm. Say, but your letters my letter was say, uplifting. Uh, uplift, uh, you know, I, you know, like I say, I got letters from everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody I can thank of writing. I'll write everybody back. <laughs> you know, a lot of time writing letters. Mm -hmm. Did you take but, any photographs or were you sending anything back? I, I, you know what, I got okay. pictures, mm -hmm. but I don't have any. I couldn't make letters and stuff because I moved here when I moved from D.C. back here. Mm -hmm. All the stuff I got rid of. I got mm -hmm. lost. Okay. Uh, you know, having to fight in those types of situations, <clears throat> did you develop well, you friendships know, we or? Well, we still pull regular duty. We had mm -hmm. to be on guard. Mm -hmm. uh, me personally, we, we got hit a lot. I okay. uh, got to the point we hit, hit so bad we actually built a bunker on the ground. So, because we hit so, so hard. Mm -hmm. In order to get any type of sleep, you had to sleep on the ground. And then when it came to monsoon season, and you know, well, body being in the ground, had so much rain, you know, you you slept and there was, you know, water right under your bed. You mm -hmm. where you slept at. I slept in the water. But yeah, it was your choice of either do that or get killed. Right. Very much. And then it got to the point, uh, I didn't eat as much. Because the reason why I didn't eat as much, I figured if I didn't eat as much, I had to, couldn't use, I don't want to use the bathroom. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was just that frightening. Right, right. Yeah. Self-preservation right. was first. Yeah. Do what you had to do. <laughs> but in those tight situations, so then where you just had um, like colleagues, did you get closer to? It was still folks? it was still segregated. Okay. And I'm gonna tell you why. Um, shortly after uh, King was assassinated, uh, James Brown wrote, wrote a record. I'm gonna say it loud, black and mm -hmm. brown. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> My wife sent that, that 45 to me. I know we could buy little stuff like record players and stuff over there too. Mm -hmm. So after I and told me, all the brothers finally had this record, they came over to my barracks that night. And oh man, we had a party. <laughs> we got back to the first sergeant, he didn't really like it. He told us that it was discriminatory. He said, well, why can't we listen to our record? You know, mm -hmm. after explaining to me why we can't listen to this music. You know, you white boys over there listening to what they want. A lot of stuff they're playing, I don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. can listen. He said, mm -hmm. well, we don't want to start a race ride. We ain't going to be no race ride. If they do it, be a race ride, they're going to start it. We're not going to do it. Right. He said, we don't want, we don't want to be fighting to be a con and, and fighting ourselves. We're not going to fight them. They're like, we're going to defend ourselves, but we're not going to start it. Start it. Mm -hmm. We're always to ourselves. We're not bothering anybody. You know, just having a good time the brothers. So we're jamming on. Say it loud. Say it loud. I mean, we were playing it loud, too. <laughs> <laughs> that was been fun. And then you said you stayed in touch with your family and folks. Were you able to write while you were there? Yeah, or? I, I wrote a letter every, every, okay. every day. I got a letter every day. And when I didn't get a letter, I was disappointed. Mm -hmm. But I got one, you know, I got mail the next day. Mm -hmm. like how, how did the mail come in? Well, so in this, you know, we, we're like, we're so well, used to emails and No, it wasn't, it wasn't text. no email. Right, right. right. So um, it came in, well, the governor lets you uh, send posters to, to veterans free. You have to pay for it. You just write on where it's going. And um, we had regular mail service. You know, the planes made back and forth to the mail every day to the DF. That's, that's what kept me on. Care mm -hmm. packs and that type of stuff. But um, if I didn't get a letter every day, it was just every, every other day. And basically, because I was writing so many letters, I kept the flow going. And I kept telling everybody to write me. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. I got letters about every day. And was there a box? There was a place to go 
Yeah. They're all in the have formation. Mm -hmm. And then they would call your name out and pick your mail up. And that's how we knew that some people didn't get no mail at all. Some people didn't even show up for mail call. Mm -hmm. It would be a special uh, formation. Okay. Mail call, and they'll call your name, and you're going to get a piece of your mail. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, um, were there opportunities for recreation there? Yeah. <laughs> that you can share? Well, <laughs> or you feel free to share? We played football. Things kind of relax. Uh -huh. You know, we played football and baseball. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff to tell keep you going. Yeah. Yeah, we played, not a whole lot, but we did. Did you socialize off off base or go into? We got what you call R&R. &R. Mm -hmm. We got a chance to go in country. Different places that wasn't in the war, so we don't mm -hmm. have places like that uh, for a week or so. Yeah, we got a little higher. Mm -hmm. I heard um, there were oftentimes issues with, you know, uh, they say black soldiers parenting or, you know, fathering children. Were you aware of any of that going on? Or? Yeah, no, Not where you, okay. Mm -hmm. um, did you have to serve with women? Or? No, there were no. When you were okay, and um, what about experiences or awareness of um, the don't ask, don't tell policy? Were there gays? No, there wasn't. There the, wasn't I'm sure there were, but I but was, you always did see them. Okay. Um, have I forgotten anything? Anything else you want to share about the I think experience there? Coming, think. Okay, and then. Um, I won't say the war ended, but when did you come home and how were you I received? I was discharged out of the um, same place I went in, in Oakland, California, uh, in February of 69. Mm -hmm. So two years of... Two years, that was good for me. That was mm -hmm. enough. They told me <laughs> to try to stay in, but no. But like I said, um, I didn't want to go in, but it was a good experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a chance to use... Uh, Benefits. Uh, I got me a good job. I got a good job. Mm -hmm. Paid free and got a choice. Uh, got a job with uh, a company in, in DC by the name of Pepco. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. um, I worked my way through the ranks. So went in as a uh, as a helper. Steam operator. We actually produce electricity for the nation's capital. It's actually D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Okay. Um, went to school. Mm -hmm. Where? Uh, with Maryland. Yeah. Okay. Got an 80 degree. Um, went to school. Uh, progressed from the ranks of a helper mm -hmm. up to a, uh, uh, a control room operator, which is the highest spot in that plant. And. Um, I can't remember, you have to organize the uh, IDW with the, with the company. Okay. Organize that. I was elected to uh, four terms of the treasurer of our local. Okay. What? I, uh, when I, when I retired from the company, I took on a full time position as a union rep for six years. So, what years were, were you there at Pepco? I went to, I went to Pepco in 1970. Okay. And I retired the first time in 2000 from there. Then I took on a uh, business rep job at local union IDW for six years. And I retired again in 06. And that's when I moved back in Savannah. Okay. So in coming back, uh, you said you went from Hawaii and then made it to D.C.? No, I, went, I went to, from Fort Bend, North Carolina, to Oakland, California, to Oakland, California, to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Vietnam, back to Oakland, California, got discharged. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't have any states I did other than Fort Myers, New Jersey, and North Carolina. Gotcha. Right. And then, so how you receive your, my family, your wife? Oh, well, everybody's happy to see me. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Community? What did you do anything Well, special? when I came back, um, I had to get adjusted back to being in the states. Mm -hmm. Because uh, everything, especially up that way, was moving pretty fast. Traffic moved. I didn't come about. Over, over a month, I didn't do any driving at all. Mm -hmm. I was afraid to because everything moved so fast. I had to basically work myself back into society because being away and then coming back, you know, different lifestyle. Um, 
I was just, you know, I woke up a lot. Well, I had these nightmares. Mm -hmm. In fact, I still have some now. I don't know what's going But then another night, I had flashbacks and stuff I remember. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and now, in fact, I just finished up a, a sleep apnea uh, exam in Charleston about a month ago. Okay. I still have problems sleeping now. Mm -hmm. I'm still having nightmares now. I seem like the whole I get to go around flashbacks. Mm -hmm. That's another thing too. I'm dealing with the VA now. But, uh, the, the VA is helping. <laughs> you don't want to call it that, yeah. Researching you. Okay. I was telling a guy the other day. I say, <clears throat> leave here and you go fight for your country. You come back, you got to fight with your country. <laughs> to get the benefits. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, they want you to go. When you come back and tell them you got a problem, you got to prove that you have a problem. I didn't have the problem when I went in there, so where did I get the problem from? That's, that's another story. Right, right. Do you stay in contact with any of the veterans? No, the only with? guy that I recall um, that was in the military was actually two guys. Um, in fact, I was actually working right across the street from one who worked for the same company, a guy named Wayne Brown. Um, he and I went to uh, AIT together and went to Fort Monmouth. Another guy named Sonny Bronson. He too was at the same time, but he lived, in fact, he and I lived around the corner from where I did. In fact, both of them lived, we all live in the same neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't, I haven't seen either one of those guys since I've been back here. And when I was actually in Fort Monmouth, I was coming home on the weekend, there were a couple of guys that I met up there that actually came to DC with me. Mm -hmm. over the weekend because they were from California. And you know, I didn't want to meet we were good friends, so rather than leaving the base on the weekend, I had a pass. We had to have a uh, come over for the weekend. Okay. But I haven't talked to this guy, I haven't seen him in a while. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I was looking on your form and you received a service medal. Yeah, when, when you go to a location uh, out of the country, everyone gets a service medal from where they were. Okay. That's where you see some of these decorated guy with all these ribbons and stuff. That's so they've traveled, to, yeah. they've been to places. various places. Now where was that yeah, bestowed bestowed, yeah. bestowed on you? When did you actually get the medal? Or how were you? That's part of your part of your dress uniform. When you come okay. back in the States you wanna put your little medals and stuff on and know where you were. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. You you told us about what you've done since you've separated from the military. So you but well, how like I said, I put, I put 30 years with Pepco. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, like for me, a guy from Savannah, mm -hmm. was going right across the street over there in Yamaha Village. Okay. And, uh, to go where I went and do what I did, especially from D.C., mm -hmm. I think I did well, very well. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And so, your, what did you learn in the military that you applied to your job? Discipline. Uh, how to adjust to being around different people. Uh, it helped me develop to be a man. Yeah. By that I mean, uh, I mean looking at kids today and, and you know and not exposed to what I was exposed to. I think that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing to go in the military if you want to go in the military because it do teach you discipline. It helps you to learn how to mingle with other different people. Mm -hmm. uh, gets you away from being a mama's boy, uh, the daddy's boy. Get out on your own. You don't know anybody. You know, gets you a chance to develop yourself. Come on, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, the some of the last ref, you know questions of reflection uh, ask you about your you know, how did your wartime experience affect your affect your life? Well, I'm still dealing with issues now. I have three claims I've, I've submitted, mm -hmm. PTSD, um, hearing loss, and uh, Agent Orange. Okay. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I've been diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. That's one of the side effects of Agent Orange. Okay. I had the Agent Orange test, but it came back negative, but since then, I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. 
I'm doing well. I'm on medication now. I go to the gym five days a week. Uh, they're having problems with sleeping. <clears throat> but other than that, I'm okay. And so Agent Orange was just, you weren't directly handling it, but it just happened in, in, in the in war. The Vietnam war. What they were doing, they actually sprayed the whole country. Right. And where they were, if you were there, you came in contact with it. I don't care whether you were in the air, on the ground, or <laughs> whatever. You came in contact with it. Uh, like I said, I took the test over a year ago. And, uh, started and I took the test, part of the test here in Savannah. The other part was in Charleston. <laughs> based on the test results, it's negative. But like I said, uh, I've been diagnosed and I have presently being treated in Pakistan now. So that's the side effect from Asian Orange. Right. Okay. What are some of the life lessons that you've learned from the military? Discipline. Like you said people Respect people. Mm -hmm. uh, some, you know, Kids nowadays, not knocking the kids down there nowadays, but I'm bringing the parents. They don't respect each other. It's, you know, it's um, my grandkids now. So you had, you, you and your oh, high school good, sweethearts, got, you I had children? I got grandkids angry. <laughs> okay, yeah. great. Um, I remember one day, this was a while ago, uh, my grandson came over to the house and told me when he saw his pair of pants, he wanted me to buy him. I told my daughter, I said, look, I'm not buying any pants for him because he learned how to wear them. I don't buy no pants sagging down. I don't, I don't know anything. I'm an old school. He wants me to buy something. I'm going to take him and buy it. And if, he, if I don't see him wear it, I'm not going to buy it no more. Mm -hmm. So we got to fix that. Fix that in a hurry. So how has your military service impacted your feelings about war and military in general? Well, do I like war? No. I, what, do we have to fight it? I guess being American, you have to. Uh, war, in my opinion, is good and bad. As long as you fight for the right thing. Uh, Afghanistan, we shouldn't have been there. Since this war. Iraq, definitely not. We should have been out there. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we were there because of Bush, President Bush, wanted to get some Donald saying, which had nothing to do with 9 11. And look what happened. We're still fighting something that we should have been in the first place. But, you know, we got to go when they call you. I don't like war, no one likes war. But, you know, we have to, we gotta have them. I guess that's keep the world turning. So just that's military it. in general, it's yeah. necessary. Yeah, you gotta have that. And it's the way things are now. Now we got we got more problems now since we went in the ranks than we ever had before. And to top it off with a black president makes it even worse. Mm-hmm. You know, deal with P's and Q's and deal with you know, deal with cards that you dealt with. Okay. So what message would you leave for future generations uh, who will see this? Hopefully they got something out of this. <laughs> they probably experienced some of the things I'm experiencing. I have experienced right today. Uh, always be aware of your surroundings. Because you never know. Is this about it? So be aware of your surroundings. And is there anything that I've forgotten to ask? I've said probed in just about everything, right? I think so. <laughs> but as a as a member of First African Baptist, I appreciate your time and your service okay. to the United States and for taking the time to interview with us no today. No and what I'm gonna do, Deborah, do you have any questions that been a church mouse over there, but at this point we can add <laughs> add to the end of the interview of some some things that came up. Did you? Well, the thing that that crossed my mind um, when you were talking about um, uh, the letters, um, I think that that's that's an important 
piece to pass on because everything is so cryptic now with the text messaging mm -hmm. and things like that. The um, I just think that letter writing is something that it's a skill yeah. kids don't even know about. That <laughs> well, you know your, what your uh, penmanship as well as the content of absolutely. what you're writing. And as somebody who grew up during that time, I know that I wrote letters every day mm -hmm. to somebody that was in the military. And that that really, when you were talking about that, that stood out for me because I lost uh, some very good friends mm -hmm. um, to uh, the war in Vietnam. And, um, you know, having that letter come back, yeah. uh, you know, because yeah. somebody yeah. Is, yeah. is not there, yeah. um, to see that it meant so much uh, to you. I appreciate you sharing that part. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Some, uh, well, like I said, that that's the only thing that kept me going, the letter writing. Uh, my mother-in-law, my brother, my sister, my cousin, yeah. everybody. And on the other end, they kept yeah. people going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They want, yeah, like yeah. you say, you want to make sure that you get a letter back. Which meant that your loved one was and still alive. Right to get them, and, then, like yeah. say, and sending care send, packages. Send care you know, packages. we would. Mm -hmm. well, so I learned how to bake yeah. just so that I could send something. friends yeah. something. Yeah. You know, and they would come. You know, they'd be all crumbled up, and it's like, well, the next time maybe I'll, you know, do a little bit better job of the packing thing. Right. I, but, had a, uh, I had a Polaroid camera back in that time. You know, one year to pull the picture out. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had yeah. a full roll camera and had a problem trying to find a film for it. Yeah. All right. But, and the other thing is the 45s. You know, our kids don't yeah. know anything about uh, 45. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And music is the other thing that helped during that right. era. Right. Right. And the messages in, in, uh, in well, the music side, at state, that if time. Got, if you got a station stateside, you had to like a little private, like a efficiency type thing on base, mm -hmm. depending on what your rank was. Um, and a lot of guys would be surprised at how much music collection people have. Like this guy, mm -hmm. guy named name was Earl. I mean, he had a, he had a nice music collection. Uh, I was just go in this area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, he had some nice music. He was so we all day, breaking a beer, listening to music. I mean, he had some nice stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. really nice stuff. Yeah. Really nice. yeah, that. It really brought back a mm -hmm. lot of things mm -hmm. to have you uh, talk mm -hmm. about that because uh, uh, in 1968 when Dr. King was uh, shot, my husband was in the military, mm -hmm. and uh, but he was stationed in Germany. Okay. And uh, we were in Germany and uh, we didn't get all the information. Mm -hmm. And Baltimore was, you know, tanks and and yeah. and everything. Yeah. It it was. It was a rough time. It was like a I rough said, period what I of thought, time. What I saw on television was actually in D.C. I thought it was a movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, the burning mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what's the name of that movie? Right. There's that couldn't possibly movie. be happening in the U.S., yeah, right? Like, we, we, we'd never experienced well, anything like well, that. Well, it's the same you know? thing with 9-11. Mm -hmm. I, was at, I was at a convention yeah. in, in San Francisco. Same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm waking up in the morning, you know, Jen and I looking at television like, what, what the world is that? What movie is that? Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually happening. Planes coming. Yeah. yeah. Real time. Yeah. Yeah. Planes coming. Mm -hmm. So I got some pictures here of what I could find. Okay. Well, let, let, let's let's see. Them with you. And your wife doesn't have any of your love letters. No. <laughs> we'll put it this way: we couldn't find any. Okay. <laughs> so this is her project. She likes to be with pictures. And stuff. Okay. She she organizing pictures and stuff. I told her what I wanted, she went out to see what she could find. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Deborah, can you look in the camera and make sure I'm... Mm -hmm. Do we need to pull it in? Mm -hmm. You can... Actually, no. Actually, we're not supposed to move the... Um... Okay. And then I'll take All pictures right, of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And tell me, what... What is this? A... Picture this of is basic, basic training. So this this is you in uniform. Well, I work uniform, basic training in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Okay. 
friend of mine named Fred in Vietnam, mm -hmm. in the Motor Pool. Mm -hmm. I can see that. And one of the Jeeps. This is my yeah. crib. <laughs> <laughs> so your space, your cot, shoes underneath. Wow. What kind of gun is that behind? That's the M16. Okay. This is after graduation at Fort Bragg. Okay, that's definitely a port of This is my luxury suite. <laughs> <laughs> Those are pretty good. So it's that yeah, cooler, I, I see hammer. Hot plate, the hot plate there. Oh, okay, I see the hot plate. The trunk mm -hmm. next Refrigerator. to it. Refrigerator. All right, all, that's all I need is right there. <laughs> all right, right here. Yeah. Who was that that you're with? My buddy and man went to Basin together. Okay. I think that's all I have. And you're on the right? I'm on the left. Oh, okay. Well, I'm the short guy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Wonderful. That's all I have. <laughs> Thank you. Let me just hit the red button again. That was good listening to that. Uh, it really brought back memories. And then may I take yeah. pictures of your sure. of your pictures? Mm -hmm. Okay. I know what they wanted us to do is uh, people. I was just with the cousin of mine that. Um, But uh, him and his brother uh, went back uh, a couple of times. You know? Mm -hmm. And, well, you know, and strange. he's still not right. I mean, oh, it's right. just... Hey, hey. Uh, I'm telling you, it was, it was experience. But he couldn't function outside of, of, the, of the military. And uh, so, well, just, guy, you know, he kept going back. When I first went to the... I just I got out of school and started my um, first job at Petro. Mm -hmm. I was a helper. I, you know, everything he put in front of me, I did everything, and just working up through the ranks. Mm -hmm. And this guy, his name was uh, Haskell Tall. I'll never forget this guy. Mm -hmm. This guy was a white guy. And it was, like I said, it was, in fact, when I went to work at Petco, they had separate washrooms. I worked on a plant, a plant right on Bedding Road. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. We were talking about mm -hmm. 34. Okay. <clears throat> they, had, they had separate uh, washrooms. Mm -hmm. It was the white, the blacks were upstairs and the whites were downstairs. You know, water coolers. But when I, when I started working there, through the process of changing all that. So when I first got us, got us my first class, I started my job, I was working as an individual, not in training. This guy named Haskell Todd, never forget this guy, white guy. Mm -hmm. Being a helper, I worked, I actually worked under him, or worked for him, so to speak. And my job was to assist him in operating the ball to make electricity. But anyway, you know, I'm, I'm sitting looking at it. I mean, looking at him, knowing that he had hate mm -hmm. and all his eyes, you could actually see it. And, uh, you know, and, I and you people out. were living through that. Yeah. And experiencing that, that in your face kind of. Racism. I mean, somebody well, I, I, just. I'm tell you what he said to me. It's terrible. He said to me, you know, he had, he had, he had, he didn't go through the same things I went through because he was white. Actually, I could tell him things about his job because he didn't know. He was actually getting hands on on the job training mm -hmm. while I was at school. Mm -hmm. I could tell him about his job things that he didn't know. Mm -hmm. So, but being but I, told, like I, I didn't go through the motions, you know, mm -hmm. aggressive type thing. To the motion and stuff like that. So when I found a girl, I don't know what I sat down a little chair with her sitting there eating my lunch. He came to me and said, uh, you know who you work for? And I'm like, I know who I'm working with. <laughs> so he says, uh, you know my name? I said, I think his name is Haskell. Haskell, Haskell Todd, right? Haskell Todd, that's what you're saying? 
That's for Target. That's your name, right? You know my name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your name Charles Black. It's okay. Stuck my hand to shake his hand. He just stuck his hand. He didn't really want to shake my hand. He says, my name is Haskell Todd. I'm an A operator. And I'm prejudiced. And you weren't shocked, were you? <laughs> Not too shocked. I stopped eating, though. I haven't eaten my lunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lunch. you gotta be careful. I said, my name is Charles Black. I'm black. I'm a Vietnam, Vietnam veteran. I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he walked away from me. Yeah. He, he walked away. Mm -hmm. All you had to say back yeah. then was Vietnam. Yeah. Because but but um, the only thing... You get to fill that out between, now that you were in the interview. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not a prejudiced person. Mm -hmm. The only one thing that's different between a white person in the South and the North. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> white folks in the South, in the North, they don't like it. They won't tell you. They do things behind your back. Now here, if they don't like you. They tell you. They ain't got to tell you they don't like you. Sometimes that's better. Why. At least you know what you're dealing well, with. Well, yeah, I'm, I respect that. <laughs> I respect somebody telling me how they feel versus somebody doing something I don't know what nothing about. I respect that. Yeah. You all done with me? Uh, we are done with you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you all.